Chapter 1. Yankee Stadium, the Bronx, Sunday, May 1st, 1927. A great ball club like a remarkable woman comes along once in a lifetime. Charlie listened to the rousing crowd. The spring air, fresh and cleansing, filtered through the ballpark, ruffling the tiny flags atop the stadium wall. The crack of the ball against the bat sent tingles up his arms. If someone had handed him a glove, he'd probably run out on the field. In the midst of the colorful multitude, his eyes were drawn to the babe. Within the month of April, in the record books, Ruth already had six home runs, two in this very game. It might be possible, if he continued at this pace, to break his 1923 record of 59 home runs. The babe trotted around like a bow-leg ox across the outfield, loosening up between the innings. Charlie's eyes darted across the field to Pennock as the ball sizzled into the catcher's mitt. This team had it all. The superb pitching, only one component, complemented the brutal hitting attack. Charlie shook his head as he watched the agile Gehrig throw practice balls across the infield grass. He had never seen a team like this. God, they were good. Not only could they head to the series, but they just might squash everyone else along the way. He looked to his friends back in the seats. They would razz him if they knew earlier he had been oogling the cavalcade of women under the grandstand. He couldn't keep his mind off one particular woman he had seen near the concession. Svelte, with expressive blue eyes, she mysteriously walked under the stands with an odd beeping leather radio box strapped to her shoulder, and she had disappeared just as he carried his food from the counter. Joel cupped his hands. Hey, Charlie! Either go get some more food or sit your ass down. I need a smoke, said Charlie. He took out a pack of Luckies from his shirt pocket. Ray wrapped his leg. Hey, Francine, know you're at the ballpark, Charlie? Charlie, cigarette hanging from his mouth, squinted at Ray and then lit up. He shook the match and tossed it to the cement as he exhaled. I don't discuss baseball with Francine. Ray leaned toward Joel. Any dame that wouldn't let me go to the ballpark? I know you guys don't like her. It's not that we don't like her, Chuck, said Joel. Charlie squeezed toward the aisle. She's just not right for you. Rumfords have too much dough, added Ray. You never had too much dough, bud. I'm getting some more food. He wanted to find that tall dame. One of the fillies stepped up to the plate. Pennock fired a strike. But Charlie had lost interest and plodded down the ramp. Ray had nailed it. Francine would be upset if she knew he'd traveled out to the stadium. Being the boss's daughter certainly helped his career, but the old man liked him and pushed the relationship. Rumors abounded about her alleged affair with a guy named Rick Cerrone from Chicago, and she had seen her old beau, Will Dillingham, on occasion. The Rumfords were stinking with money, and Charlie could look forward to a life of comfort and security. Once under the grandstand girders, he searched for the lady in the blue chiffon frock. The crowd above cheered, and he realized how much he loved the game. He could taste that feeling, a raw combination of hot dogs, onions, and cold beer, accented with passing stale cigars and pungent bags of second-rate peanuts. Starting at the concession, he thought about his ambition, and then he began a methodical march under the grandstand. After his arrival from his parents' farm and subsequent graduation from New York University, and employment at the Rumford Tower, he remained fueled by a lust for wealth and power. He snuffed out the cigarette on the concrete. Then he saw her. Mother McCree! At first he thought she eyed him with more than just a passing glance. Tall and slender, she flowed within the transient crowd. Not exactly ballpark attire, her blue frock outlined her lean body, and her rusty hair bobbed in the shingle look gave her a certain classiness he liked. Something about her made the aura of mystery drew him closer. He drifted inconspicuously under the grandstand and stared at her large leather case, but this time it admitted no beeps. Sweet Jasmine filled the air before he innocently approached. She panned the rafters as if she were a structural engineer. He could not keep his eyes off her tight, tanned face sprinkled with freckles. As he inched closer, the stadium light cast an iridescent glow within her blue eyes. Miss, I could swear you were watching me. Should I be? She raised her thin brow. Charlie's smile widened. Following me could get you into trouble. 
You come to the stadium often? She kept studying the girders and then turned abruptly. Perhaps it is you who has been watching me. Who, me? She lifted her brows again, and her tiny mouth evidenced a smile as she turned. Her perky but proper, almost British accent surprised him. To answer your question, I come to the ballpark games not as often as I would like. I'd like to get out here more often, too, said Charlie. Then again, actually being at the ballpark is better than watching newsreels. In her face, he sensed a youthful exuberance and an appreciation of life, but that glint in her eyes suggested she had hidden something inside. She fiddled with the leather case. Charlie folded his arms. Right, it's like reading about the game in the Sun of the Times. It's not the same. He knew as she stared at the girders again, she had little in common with a typical Yankee fan. This is a unique era. Babe Ruth had two home runs today. I actually saw the second one. Babe's going to have a good year. I can feel it. Oh, he definitely will. Oh, is that right? And how do you know that, Miss... Jamel? French? Oh, no, no. She covered her mouth, trying not to laugh. Did I say something funny? No, no, you didn't. I'm laughing because I do have a unique name. She stared into his eyes. Charlie knew the look. What would Francine say to the old man if she saw him talking to this bright-eyed chickadee? Returning to the stands would be the smart move. But he wanted to know more about Jamel. You live around here? Before she could answer, the leather case erupted with a series of high-pitched tones and static. She backed away with a panicky look and spoke into the case. Now, Elf, it's just a malfunction, that's all. Hey, what is that? Some kind of radio? She stopped, still flustered. Right, radio. Are you with the Army or something? It's none of my business, but I've never seen people carrying around a radio. It's really not that important. Her smile looked phony. Who's Elf? Are you in the Army? Well, I, I'm on a mission of sorts. I don't understand. I'm, I'm sorry. She extended her tiny hand. My name is Charlie. I'm sorry, Charlie. She started to go away, but he caught her. Hey, was it something I said? No, maybe it's just better I don't get involved. This is all so precarious. I'm afraid I might change something. I know you don't understand. No, I don't. She paused again, staring into his eyes, and shrugged her shoulders. Enjoy the game. Enjoy the season. You won't see the likes of it again. With ambivalence in her eyes, she scurried toward the gate. Charlie took two steps and then stopped. Her mysterious nature made her even more appealing. He watched her frock swaying at the hips all the way to the turnstile. He stopped on the other side, and she gave him a quick wave with her fingers. As quickly as she had come into his life, she vanished in the stadium parking lot. He had no business chasing after her, but she had sent his head spinning. Without a second thought, he sprinted across the concrete and rushed through the turnstile. Where did you go? He chided himself as he surveyed the area. For a few moments, a hint of jasmine lingered in the fresher air. He checked the stadium and massive cars parked in the Bronx parking lot. That bright-eyed woman, tall and slender, along with her radio bag, had vanished like Houdini. He kicked an imaginary ball, then shook his head all the way back to the grandstand ramp. The trim green outfield grass rose above the ramp. Before he returned to his friends, Charlie looked toward the turnstile one more time. Letting her leave could only be described as the premier boner. As he took his seat, he heard Ray's prattling. Do you realize how many clean plays he's made? Who? asked Charlie. Tony the Wop. It's like he can't make an error. Charlie, still distracted, bit his thumbnail as Joel leaned over. Hey. What do you say we go outside after and see if we can catch the babe before he leaves? Swell, said Charlie. Something wrong, Charlie? Charlie lit another lucky and shook his head. Nah, everything's just fine, bud. Everything's just fine.